Small Changes, Big Impact, a DFCM podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jeremy Resmovitz. With the pandemic of COVID-19 spreading everywhere around the world right now, there's a lot of fear, frustration, and anxiety. On the flip side, there's a lot of innovation, connectedness in novel ways and reflection going on. In the spirit of physically distancing ourselves and innovating, we've decided to continue our podcast through Zoom. Today, we interviewed Ross Upshur and discussed hot topics in COVID-19. Take a listen, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. Stay safe and be well. So some of the questions, so the work that I'm doing right now is, is not so much clinical, but I'm an advisor to advisors. So I'm working with the World Health Organization, with Medicine Sans Frontier, Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, you know, Ministry of Health, um, co- and also doing a lot of work from the point of view of the School of Public Health. Uh, so yesterday I was the moderator of a panel uh, where we were looking at uh, um, new tools that are being developed that allow uh, a better understanding of the evolution of the outbreak in terms of modeling in the community and modeling uh, the uh, demand uh, for hospital services. So I've worked on, and so the backstory uh, is that after, so it would start actually with SARS. So Sunnybrook was, uh, you're asking, I'm already talking and we should. Oh, we're yeah. in, so, just, we're in. Okay. We're in, don't worry. So, so in SARS, Sunnybrook was a SARS hospital. So we basically closed the doors to the clinic and started sending people doing house calls. I got seconded out to um, York Region Public Health because I actually have specialty training in public health medicine. And uh, I'm kind of like a, a, a prior cruder version of Jeff Kwong. I was doing a lot of work on uh, modeling respiratory disease in populations using ICES data. So I started out as a communicable disease uh, modeler. I did work on outbreak investigations while I was a, a resident and have always kept my foot in that element of public health because during SARS, I went to York Region to do the modeling and figuring out the uh, patterns of spread of SARS in the community, but it never spread in the community. It was a nosocomial outbreak. So I got drag, I got brought in to be doing medical officer of health work, and I ended up uh, being the uh, quarantine enforcer. <laughs> so that led me to start to think about ethical issues I'm in listening. public health response. Uh, with colleagues at the Joint Center for Bioethics, we published a paper in the British Medical Journal. We also added a section to the Naylor Report, and that turned into a, a, a white paper called Stand on Guard for Thee, which sets out the kind of principal ethical issues that will be raised in a pandemic. We were thinking about influenza, but they're actually germane to coronavirus. That then became the template of the World Health Organization guidance document. That's how I started working with the World Health Organization. I chaired the working group on uh, health workers uh, obligations to care in a pandemic. And then uh, we were also, that was around the time I became the director of the Joint Center for Bioethics. And I was the uh, director of the WHO Collaborating Center for Bioethics. After I stepped down from that role, I became uh, still part of the Collaborating Center, but I've had the lead for uh, ethics and epidemics uh, ever since. So that means I've worked on uh, SARS, MERS to a certain extent, Uh, pandemic H1N1 influenza, both Ebola outbreaks. I took a little bit of a pass on Zika, but I was still peripherally involved. And so what we find are the same issues arising again and again. So 
first issues, and it depends on when they arise. So right now there's a big concern around resource allocation. How do you fairly allocate resources in scarcity? So we had a paper published in the New England Journal of uh, Medicine on Monday that sets out some principles that you might want to think about for allocating things like ICU beds, hospital admissions, and then into personal protective equipment. Um, in fact, uh, I'd like to talk about that if you don't mind. I read that article. Yeah. And so, but first I'd like to say that um, you set out a framework for ethical principles to guide how to plan pandemically. But first I think we need to state that I, at least I in this conversation, in this world, think you have intrinsic value as we get into a guide of ethical principles that guide this, okay? Yes. <laughs> Based on everything you just said, I think you bring a lot of intrinsic value, you know, for the sake of, uh, of just valuing what we should be doing, because we're gonna get into a talk about values, obviously. Yes. So, so I, I just wanna let you know, because I think we, on our previous talks, we both have mentioned that nobody really listens to us at home. And yeah. so, <laughs> I'm here listening today, okay? Okay. So, so let's talk. The, about the irony is, people now want to read stuff I wrote 15 years ago on the justification of quarantine, uh, how you uh, figure out what the limits of responsibility are in a pandemic. It's it's quite remarkable. And then, of course, all the stuff that uh, I, I was working on on how we understand and interpret and utilize evidence. So, but didn't you? Aren't you the one that wrote that um, those that don't learn? Uh, their lessons are deemed to repeat it or something. Well, that's, uh, that's a, that's a Santa. So the, the person who wrote that is George Santayana, who's a famous uh, American philosopher. He's remembered for that quotation. And people actually forget uh, where that quotation came from. It was on a four volume uh, book that he wrote on the history of reason um, in, in society. Uh, and of course, the idea of, is that we actually don't like to learn our lessons from the past. That's why we're condemned to repeat them. Oh, uh, that's the line. Yeah. yeah. So that's that. That was that comes to uh, towards the end. I think of the third volume. I've got it written down. I always mess it up. Um, and so after the Ebola outbreak in 2014 with one of my PhD students, we wrote a, a paper about uh, lessons learned from uh, epidemics. And the only lesson we learn is that we don't like to learn lessons because, and I have this whole riff, which I set it up that, you know, SARS was a wake up call. We have to learn lessons. You know, a couple of years later, H1N1, a wake up call. We have to learn lessons. Ebola, we, a wake up call. We have to learn lessons. And I kind of recapitulate uh, all of those arguments. They're all the same lessons. So we either have collective, uh, you know, uh, amnesia because we keep forgetting or collective narcolepsy because we keep needing to be woken up. Uh, and so the same recurrent issues, resource allocation, use of restrictive measures, global governance and global citizenship, health workers' uh, obligations to care keep coming up and they are playing out in spades with the uh, coronavirus outbreak. Yeah, um, we are definitely at risk because of not learning our past lessons. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really scary, actually. Um, I'm a community doctor, and I mean, I don't have the uh, amount of personal protective equipment necessary to see patients daily. Uh, yeah. We've switched to phone, we've switched to video, but there are still things that you can't um, not see. Uh, and, and we're talking about germane things like taking staples out of somebody who's post-op. I can't yeah. let those, the skin grow over the staples. Uh, you still have to see people and, and you know, it just, it puts people at risk. Yeah, so there's a couple of framing considerations uh, to contextualize uh, concerns about duty to care. Um, so one thing to remember is that for most of human history, uh, physicians cared for patients without any personal protective equipment. Um, if you go to the original codes of ethics for both the Canadian Medical Association and the American Medical Association, written in the late 19th century, around the time we started to appreciate antisepsis, uh, mm -hmm. there are provisions in there that say, it, during times of pestilence, it is the physician's duty to care for the patient, even at risk to their own lives. That's right. The other thing is that globally, 
you know, it's a planet inhabited by 7 billion people, uh, the vast proportion of whom are served in healthcare services where they don't have running water or soap. So when I was convening uh, uh, the global group at, uh, uh, in the late, uh, for the uh, pandemic influenza guidelines, we had to come up with advice for all the healthcare workers in the world. And I remember writing that, you know, minimally, we want to make sure that they have access to soap and water. And I was told that that is something that could not be reliably uh, secured for all healthcare workers on the planet. So we are, I'm not saying that personal protective equipment isn't important. Don't misconstrue my argument. But the reality is many of our peers and colleagues, and, and we can't, you know, if we're going to truly take global solidarity into account for a global pandemic, our peers in many health systems are going to be providing care without personal, without any personal protective equipment. Now, after SARS, there was a big issue about whether, and that was, you know, again, the Campbell Commission report is a lengthy report written by Justice Campbell, looking at whether um, leaders in both government and in health institutions uh, were diligent enough in uh, taking steps to protect healthcare providers. The argument was, of course, that they didn't. And going forward in the future in all uh, pandemics, we should be optimally uh, prepared to protect all of our healthcare providers. And, you know, I'm getting the same calls, uh, you know, because a lot of my, uh, uh, you know, classmates and friends are community-based family docs. And I understand their concerns. Um, so we're going to have to... Um, Includes a solution on the fly rather than as recommended uh, in many of our guidance documents to actually have policies and procedures in place about who's going to do what in the event of something like this happening. So we have a lot of um, guidance right now. I don't know if you've seen, there's a plan A, which is what the ideal plans are to, you know, enough personal protective equipment to go around. There's plan B, reusable, reusable uh, personal protective equipment and there's plan C, which is, um, we wish you the best of luck. And uh, yeah. you know, we hope you don't get it. Yeah. So how are we, like, so we have a couple systems that we get to look at right now. So one, um, you're at the Dalana School of Public Health in Toronto. So yep. we could look at Toronto, we could look at Ontario, we could look at Canada, we could look at North America, and then we could obviously go global here. So my question to you is, what should we, be focusing on right now as uh, community doctors? And we can talk about each system, I guess. What can we do? Like, I guess when I, when I say what my focus is or what should our focus be, should we be focusing on prevention? Should we be focusing on cure? Like, how can we all, I think everybody wants to contribute somehow. What, yeah. is the, how, what should we be focusing on? So I think one key thing that uh, family physicians can do now um, is be trusted communicators of good information. And that may mean, uh, you know, I think everybody's going to have to go back and say, gee, I wish I paid more attention in medical school to all the lectures I had on public health and why it's important. Um, and, and the public health messaging uh, is, and it's, I've been pleased by how it's been supported by the clinical world. I think people who look at the numbers and see what's happening in Italy and Spain in particular, uh, the last thing they want is something like that happening here. And our best chance at preventing that, and this is the prevention message, is to support uh, and uphold the uh, physical distancing uh, measures that are put in place. And uh, one of the things I've been circulating is a, is a brilliant document that actually walks through the population health rationale for why we need to act this way. So yes, some of it's based on modeling, but those models are now well informed by data from China, from Italy, uh, it's our best chance for something to work. So if we get a bunch of family physicians saying, you know, following along the pages of Trump saying, well, the, the cure is worse than the disease, let's just get back to normal. Uh, if, we have, if we have people who are respected in their communities because they're leaders of their medical societies, uh, falling off message, that's going to be harmful. 
the, the second thing is, uh, yes, we may not have all the personal protective equipment we want, but if we don't provide care for our patients, who will? So there's a, you know, a set of independent reasons based in our capacity to be a self-regulating profession that obliges us to be the ones that provide care. Um, I know this doesn't make me popular, even if we may need to take on a bit of additional risk. Now we're gonna have to look in our own souls, each and one of us individually, about where we draw that line. But if patients who are looking for care, if they don't come to see us, they'll show up in the emergency. Somebody somewhere is going to have to care for sick patients. And we have a whole system called medicine, and we train uh, people called physicians. We give them particular privileges in our society to do things because they've got an exclusive license to do things like diagnose, uh, prescribe, um, and so there's a bit of a soft social contract uh, that uh, gives physicians the authority and power to do the things they do. And I have this feeling that if we don't show up, that might be rene renegotiated and uh, uh, we could become uh, wage earners and employees like other jobs. Yeah. And we've got the skills, right? Because of our training, we know more about how to treat the sick uh, than other people in society, despite Google's doctors and uh, all the other methods that people seek out for information. So that's, that's, you know, reflecting on why we have the authority, the prestige, uh, the kind of, you know, why we're considered a profession, why we have licenses, why we have training programs, uh, and all of the social resources that are invested to produce us as physicians, I think does give us a particular obligation to find ways to ensure that we're responding to the health needs in a time of crisis. It's almost as if what you're saying is we have a fiduciary duty, almost like we took an oath yeah, you know, imagine that. Imagine that we actually are fiduciaries. Yes, we are. And, and that's what the law is. So if you look at the uh, uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, uh, they have a policy on this. And it's very clear there is an expectation that we will provide care. Um, we went through and I can send you all the, uh, we did a lot of studies on this. And, and, and you know, the public is uh, supportive in some of our survey work and our, our focus group work of reasonable, um, you know, accommodations. So, for example, if there are physicians who, for reason of age and morbidity, may be put at particular risk, it would be advisable to repurpose them to do work that doesn't put them in harm's way. And, you know, of course, that's why we have, and, and you know, but you're going to need to work it out in your own clinic. So, younger, healthier physicians who are more likely to withstand uh, a COVID infection should they get it would be the first line of defense. Uh, but we should have had all of these policies and procedures and guidance documents uh, uh, hammered out uh, in advance instead of scurrying to put them together now. I'm lucky, uh, I, I work as a solo practitioner. <laughs> so you've got, yeah, so you don't have it, you're on your own, right? You have uh, very little backup. Um, so, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I had this intuition um, back when we were doing a lot of this research, when we were interviewing people after SARS and people were saying, you know, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't think I could get ill uh, in this way uh, um, in my work. And I was thinking, really? Like touching sick people? Like you didn't really think that you could be put in the way of infection by becoming a healthcare provider. So it's like we've, and I, I actually tried to get this as a kind of screening question when on admissions interviews, right? Do you know that by becoming a physician, you will be exposed to every bug that's out there? Uh, and particularly if you've got a large pediatric population that you serve. I mean, everybody knows and remembers from their internship and their residency, when doing pediatrics, your immune system gets reintroduced to a lot of, as just like when your, your kids are young, right? So we are in one of the riskiest uh, uh, possible occupations for uh, being infected in the course of our duties. We always have. Uh, right. Since time immemorial, Hippocrates recognized this. So, so let me ask you then, 
given that we are at risk, um, and given that um, we've got these ethical guidelines driving us or, or guiding us, I guess, um, on how to respond, um, what is the best way to test or identify people at risk? And should, and should uh, healthcare workers be getting tested more often? In terms of their uh, tested for coronavirus, you mean? Well, or tested for their uh, emotional and psychological resiliency to perform the tasks that they are required by their jobs. Is there a test for the latter? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, but I think HQ nine. Yeah, they, that's right. Um, you know, I'm I'm really talking about testing uh, as far as antibody testing. I'm talking about NPs. I'm talking about um, you know what. I'm not going to put down qualitative data, but if you ask no. somebody, listen, how are you feeling today? And they're like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. That's a valid response. I agree. So uh, one of the sort of buffers to the duty to care obligations of physicians is that you, you'll see this um, in the priority setting uh, um, thinking that people like physicians, nurses, healthcare providers who are on the front line actually have, when it comes to if we have medications, if we have vaccines, uh, they have a good argument to being higher on the priority list uh, for receipt of those uh, goods. Um, and so when we're going to be working through the PPE uh, priority setting, it's clearly going to be going to people who are on the front lines working in healthcare uh, that have first claim on it over and above uh, other essential services who may, we may have a duty to protect, but they're really not on the, on the firing line in terms of exposure. I'm not sure if you saw it, the New York Times has had some fabulous graphics, but they had this one um, tool that allowed that it had uh, the risk of exposure and the, uh, the probability of exposure and harm by uh, uh, occupational categories. And of course, the far, you think of the axes, up here in the top right was like 100% uh, likelihood of exposure and 100% uh, risk. And, you know, family physicians are on the top of that list. Um, and so you can see where, and it has this whole kind of sweep of it. Uh, uh, so we're always, so because we're at such a uh, uh, risk, that means that when it comes to handing out uh, 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 or, or distributing scarce resources, they have a first claim because of that, as opposed to they had artists and sculptors who were way down at the bottom of like, their, 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 their probability of exposure is low and their, prob and their risk of of uh, of, a, of being ill because of their uh, um, their mode of work is also low. But they healthcare workers have an instrumental value towards improving the health of everybody. Yes, and that's part of uh, that's another additional uh, argument in favor of their being high on the priority list. Right now, I've been reading this journal recently. It's a great journal. It's called the New Yorker. Have you been? Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite journals. Um, have you read um, Atul Gawande's um, article about uh, keeping the coronavirus from infecting healthcare workers? No, I haven't read that yet. I've, I've, I've got a big stack of, we have a subscription. Uh, so uh, they tend to get stacked up and I read them in bulk when I'm on holidays. I've been, uh, I'll, I'll, so I'll definitely track that one down. What did he have to say? Because he's usually quite insightful. He is. So he's saying that... Um, well, first of all, the testing that they're doing in Singapore and Hong Kong um, and, and in China is much different than the testing that we're doing. They're, they're making sure that there are no false negatives. Yeah. Got three and four tests going out before they're saying somebody's recovered completely. Yeah. And they're making sure that their healthcare workers are completely covered. They, what they did from the onset is that they put down, they did a mass lockdown. And they made sure that every healthcare worker used um, personal protective equipment, masks, goggles, um, visors, uh, basically hazmat, hazmat suits to see every patient regardless of what they had. Yeah. And, and it's shutting it down. And if somebody, and they tested the people who um, got infected, if you were infected, they tracked down any contacts and they put those people in quarantine also. And so yes. we, we're not seeing the same rise that we're seeing in Italy, Spain, yeah. 
the U.S. now, right? And I'm, and I'm afraid uh, that Ontario is going to escalate into this. Well, you know, I've, I've been working on this thing called clinical public health. And I think this, this, is, this is a nice illustration of its importance. So a lot of people are pointing to the effectiveness of you know, China, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Korea, um, and conditioning on uh, the implementation of restrictions and lockdowns. But as you pointed out, and if you read the WHO report uh, on the, uh, that the high blue li- ribbon panel went over and issued a report, China mobilized 10,000 teams of five people each of contact tracers and testers in the community good old fashioned, what I'd call shoe leather epidemiology. And of course, the ones they were avidly after were the contacts of people in healthcare who became exposed. So it's not just the restrictions, it's uh, testing and tracing and following up in the community. And they continued with that even when there was intense uh, transmission in the community. In other words, they didn't succumb to nihilism that now that we're in tertiary spread, you can't track it down anymore. There's no point in contact tracing and testing. They, they did not surrender on that front. They also brought every, I think, CT scan they could move into Wuhan, and they mobilized a large number of healthcare providers to go and work there. So it was a multi-pronged intervention. And so teasing out or, you know, and they had mobile apps and all sorts of things. It wasn't any one of them. uh, It's really hard to estimate which was the most effective of them all, but they combined. And now we can contrast because certain other systems uh, have used different uh, methods. And now modelers are actually able to estimate what they think the contribution of each of these independent uh, strategies are to the control of the disease. And I'll flip you a link uh, to a paper that shows how all of this is calculated. And I think that's something that healthcare provi- you know, physicians in particular would be, I'm sending it to all my physician friends because it actually explains the epi and the rationale and provides the data for why this may or may not work. So, so I, I, that's amazing. You're, you know, you're, one of your titles is, um, is it, director or uh, at, at the Dalana School of Public Health? Is it? Uh, division head. Division head, sorry. Yep. I knew it started with a D. Um, <laughs> how can we then mobilize and use our sentinels, our family doctors, our primary care physicians in the, in the community yeah. better? How yeah. can we do this better? Because, you know, um, I, today I got a call this morning from a, from a really nice friend of mine who said, by the way, do you have enough equipment in your office to make sure that people aren't going to emerge. So you're taking care of your patients. And I said, no. And he said, well, here's the name of someone. Um, We can order, we can do a mass order. And so I've been talking with this gentleman about centralizing distribution um, for Toronto, for Ontario, for PPE, because, and then we started talking about resources and information and specialist consults and the need to actually set things up so that we start thinking about um, how we can do things better in the future, you know, preparing for. Yes. Yeah. Fun. All that stuff that we were talking about. Yeah. All the lessons. And so yeah. the, the funny thing is, so here I am this morning, I sent an email out to my physician health uh, organization or family health organization. And I said, who needs PPE for their office? So it's like 26 physicians in my group. And I'm getting emails back from people who are like, I need this many boxes. And we're trying to cover uh, front office staff. We're trying to do the calculation, patients, front office staff, the physician themselves, nurses. Um, And and it's really, really expensive to use single use masks or single use equipment every time one patient comes in, because you look at the the just like exponential use of Mm -hmm. PPE. And the interesting thing is somebody called me who was on the list and said, why are you doing this? And I said, what do you mean? He said, why would you pay for this equipment? This should be coming from public health. Why would you waste your money and spend it yourself? I said, well, public health isn't giving out enough PPE to everybody. Well, it's not. So just to, for a correction, it's not public health that gives that out. It's the ministry of health. the, The ministry of health gives out the SARS kits or gave out the SARS kits. 
Uh, they're the ones that are responsible for its uh, for much of the procurement and distribution. Regardless, um, so the Ministry of Health, but they're not. They don't seem to be mobilizing anytime soon and giving out these kits and and doing everything. So we have to mobilize and start doing these things. These things ourselves. We, like I said, we have this fiduciary duty to care for people. Yeah, crazy, absolutely crazy. So as we get more and more PPE, because they will come in. And as we see the cases rise in Ontario, God willing, it does not. But if we see it, what can we do as family physicians to mobilize? How can we best be utilized on the front lines to, to improve this? Yeah. So here we're going to run up against uh, a reality that dawned on some of us a couple of decades ago. We like to talk about us having a healthcare system when we don't have a system. We, we have, have a health care system. We don't have a sick care system. Well, we, we can take care of healthy people very yeah. well. <laughs> well, we, we have services. Um, we have an abundance of services, but there's no central processing unit. So to, a system uh, part and whole connect uh, and, and relate to each other. So uh, interestingly, you know, I've been teaching this course uh, in the uh, MPH Family and Community Medicine on history, philosophy, and ethics of public health. So the last lecture I gave was all of the reasons why we don't have a system and why we need a system. Um, uh, you know, my frustration at what's playing out uh, uh, is quite considerable because we did have an opportunity and I kind of walk back through the history from Flexner uh, to the present on, you know, people think, oh, well, Flexner said nothing about public health. Absolutely not. He had a fair amount of things to say about the importance of public health and its integration with clinical care. My favorite report is the 1964 a Royal Commission on Health Services and Physician, uh, uh, Physicians and health, uh, Human Health Resources. It was the companion to the Hall Report, uh, which led to the founding of Medicare. And time after time after time, uh, they make the point about how it's important for public health to be integrated with clinical care. They bemoan the fact that public health physicians have become indifferent to the clinical world uh, and, don't, and that uh, clinicians have become indifferent to public health and hygiene and how we need to reconstruct our education and our educational systems to better and our and our healthcare system delivery to better integrate. So this whole thing when I started clinical public health and everybody said, oh, that's an oxymoron. You can't have clinical and public health in the same uh, sentence or in the same phrase because clinical is over here. I see one patient at a time and public health is over here. We don't do individual service delivery. That was exactly the polarization that the Hall, uh, or pardon me, the Royal Commission identified in the early 60s before we even designed our current health system to avoid, yet we did the, our very best to actually silo and separate those uh, worlds. That was called out again in the uh, Naylor Commission that these these solitudes can no longer exist. So maybe after this, we'll get our act together and build systems up. So what can family physicians do? A huge amount. So you mentioned sentinel surveillance, being the eyes and ears on the ground as to what's happening in the community, but feeding that to somebody who's actually going to do something and feed it back to you uh, uh, in, in real time in a dynamic way so that people on the front lines are always uh, uh, informed by the best epidemiological data. They're told what, what, what works and what doesn't work, but we need to actually purposefully build that system. So I'd love to operationalize at least one thing out of this um, talk this morning. Um, other than mobilizing PPE so frontline workers can start doing testing, um, the problem is getting tests. Mm. And, uh, right, that's the second barrier to all of this is that there's a, um, there's a bottleneck on the amount of tests that we have. You know, I, I'm part of the Sentinel network for influenza. And so they pushed Well out. done. Thank you. And so they, they pushed out a, um, a notice that said, uh, well, you can start using the NP swabs for coronavirus. Well, that's great, fantastic. I said, please send me some more swabs. And they said, sure, we'll send you five. <laughs> we I'm don't sorry. have them, but yeah. 
okay, like, I'm willing to put myself out there to help swab so you don't have to go to an assessment center where I can do everything myself here and you're giving me five. Well, I got a call um, two days ago to, to give up all of my swabs so they can go to St. Mike's because they're at a, at a um, plet uh, no, a scarcity of, of swabs right now. So I gave up my swabs because I don't even have the PPE to last more than three days here if I was to see um, 60 patients. I mean, forget yeah. about it. What am I supposed so, to do? So, so this is, uh, I mean, I'm going to speak frankly, this is scandalous that we should be in a situation of facing a major uh, respiratory pandemic uh, and you've, got, you've been offered up five swabs and it has to go to one of the major uh, academic health science centers because they're short. How, how, how is this possible? It doesn't have to. It's just that I'm offering it. I've been asked. Yeah, I know. But you're being, I, I think it was a, a legitimate thing to do, right? You know? Yeah. The other issue is that like, you know, you can see barriers everywhere. Um, three weeks ago when I ordered hand sanitizer, um, you know, the, the major uh, suppliers to medical offices in Toronto, Medical Mart and Sergo, um, Medical Mart was back ordered and Sergo said, oh sure, but we've tripled the price. Yeah. So we've got capitalism um, versus like social democracy and, and, and human, um, um, human rights. Yep. I, I think it's, I, mean, I don't know if, if purchasing hand sanitizer is a human right, but um, we're trying to do our best here. And to be able to then raise the price because of your capitalistic principles seems unjust, I guess. Well, it is. And, and um, you know, in my dark moments, because I've been hearing a lot of uh, different accounts, you know, sitting at a table with people from the World Health Organization about uh, how creative uh, profiteering has become uh, and all the ways that people are looking to make money out of this unfortunate event. And it kind of reminded me, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie o Orson Welles, uh, The Third Man. So uh, Orson Welles plays this guy, Harry Lyme, who's a profiteer. He's a black market uh, uh, of penicillin. And this is in just after the end of the Second World War. So he's a real nefarious characters it's a an excellent movie to watch so i was thinking we need to come up with kind of a, a hairy lime shame award uh for the most egregious uh, profiteering and use social media to sort of like no you can't do this i think the government should be very clear uh, uh on on going in and checking and calling out and regulating price increases for uh, materials unless you know the manufacturer can say my costs have gone up uh, and and prove that uh, but if their production costs haven't gone up and they're just making their uh, they're trying to increase their profit margins of course that should be discouraged by all means necessary yeah so that still leaves us with um, I just want to get your comments on whether or not we should be doing blood tests then for antibodies are we at that point yet where we can have you heard anything so yet? So the, um, the, the really the best source of information daily on the outbreak, in my estimation, is a listserv called ProMed. Uh, it's the Program on Emerging Infectious Diseases. Uh, this was a listserv started by infectious disease specialists, public health specialists, and virologists in the early 90s after the Institute of Medicine issued a report called Emerging and Reemerging Infectious infectious diseases, which is the blueprint. I mean, uh, this event that we're living has been predicted by experts for quite some time. So they started ProMed as a way of exchanging reliable information. So it's a moderated listserv. Uh, it provides a daily update on, on coronavirus. And when I was uh, working in public health uh, during SARS, uh, uh, ProMed was an absolute lifeline. And I've relied upon it heavily through uh, H1N1 influenza, both Ebola outbreaks and Zika, because it's authoritative. So they had a report I think the day before, uh, just in the last few days, about there finally being a reliable antibody test. So there's lots of people out there saying, oh, we've got an antibody test, but 
as you know, lab, lab work is finicky and you need it to be reliable. You need it to be valid. Um, you need it to be scalable. So I think we're now just getting to the point where we're going to have reliable serology. Now that'll be important. Uh, so we'll need to know what the acute and convalescent uh, levels are. We'll need to know what counts as protective titers. Uh, but I think we're, we're soon to have reliable blood tests. They're not there now. When we do, and I'm hoping they're doing this in Wuhan as we speak, you can go out in the community and actually calculate the denominator. We still do not know the true, you know, as everybody says, we're seeing the tip of the iceberg in uh, the overwhelmed uh, hospital system but we don't know what the community spread is like. And the only way we're going to do that is through uh, random serology surveys. Yeah. Uh, and then we can, then we can, you know, I don't know if you saw the thing by John Ionidas, you know, this is all, there's no evidence underlying our, um, our response and we need to know the true case fatality rate. And we need to know this, that, and the other thing, of course, we need to know that those are all priorities that we identified uh, at the meeting in Geneva in February, when we were looking at research projects, priorities. But if you don't have a reliable uh, serology test, you can't get that information to calculate what the true case, you know, the true uh, fatality rates are. So I think that would be a very helpful tool to help us manage the outbreak a bit better. And so have you heard anything about, uh, I'm just covering hot topics now. That's yeah. what we're doing now. Um, have you heard anything about um, chloroquine? Um, yeah. So because all of my friends are just drinking gin and tonic. Don't. <laughs> so the other working group I'm sitting on is the therapeutics working group. And there's another really good lesson uh, here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, just, sorry if I go on for a long time. But remember back to Ebola. In August 2014, uh, I think it was on August 12th, uh, I was invited to a meeting by Margaret Chan, who was then the Director General. She convened a small group of people uh, to ask and answer the question, should we proceed with the fast tracking of the evaluation of therapeutic agents uh, for Ebola virus disease. At that time, you know, remember ZMAP? ZMAP had been tried in like six macaque monkeys. There were 20 treatment courses available in the world. There was some concern that there were, uh, or some thought that there were repurposed antivirals that can be uh, brought in to, to use this. So we said, yes, let's fast track the evaluation. So we're going to basically hop over the usual animal preclinical phase one, phase two, phase three, and in a very structured, careful way, introduce these through a path that we called monitored emergency use into clinical trials. And then I chaired the working group on uh, ethics and clinical trials for the World Health Organization. Fast forward, so what came out of this are what are called platform adaptive randomized trials. And uh, so we went from a position in 2014 August where Ebola virus disease had 70% mortality, no known medical countermeasures, no drugs, no vaccines, to August 2019 uh, when we had uh, a licensed vaccine and the reports from an adaptive platform clinical trial in the Democratic Republic of Congo that showed that two monoclonal antibodies flipped the mortality curve from 70% uh, fatality rate to 70% survival rate. And the only way we did that was through the rigorous testing and evaluation of therapeutics. Every clinician, you know this, Jeremy, everybody thinks this will work, that'll work. And we knew early in Ebola, people were sticking everything that they had, like repurpose, you know, maybe an antiretroviral will work. So I understand the, that physicians abhor therapeutic vacuum and trying something is better than nothing. That was Donald Trump's argument. But we really need rigorous assessment. And so the World Health Organ, the, the R&D blueprint, so the WHO is just the convening organization, but actually the NIH, Gates, Wellcome Trust, everybody's funding this, has a trial called the Solidarity Trial. It's a rapid, it's a like a pragmatic, adaptive platform design, and chloroquine is one of the arms. And because this is being fanned out globally, uh, people will sign on to the protocol, adapt it, put it in. We should be able to get answers within 28 days. And the beauty of an adaptive design is if something works, 
you keep it in. And if it works better than the standard of care, then the placebo arm drops out. And now you have a multi-armed comparative effectiveness trial. If something doesn't work, it gets kicked out. If a new candidate comes in, it kicks on. It's like a perpetual motion machine and it keeps going and it can generate answers because the way that the uh, solidarity trial is designed is a 28 day uh, mortality endpoint. So simple clinical outcomes, clear inclusion exclusion criteria, get an answer. And then you design, uh, you know, there's a lot more questions we need to answer, but rather than everybody going out and, you know, getting, you know, what was it, uh, that unfortunate person who saw chloroquine on a label for some sort of cleaning product and got, got you know. For the aquarium. For the aquarium, like, don't do that. So, so, you know, it's really hard to get people to believe and trust in science because it's not about faith, it's about reason. And we will get answers easier if we work together and mobilize the massive amount of research capacity we have globally because this you know Sierra Leone Guinea and Liberia are at the bottom of every development list they have no functioning healthcare system you know when they talk about flattening the curve and here's the health system capacity their system capacity is the x axis right they got nothing and we managed to get a vaccine trial then DRC has you know militias running around with machine guns and often shooting up healthcare uh, facilities but we got answers we can do this if we put our minds to it when did the trial start do you know? Uh, which one? Well, when's the 28 days up? When do we? Uh, so, so people are signing on. The protocol's approved. It's, uh, it should be up and running in systems around the world. Okay. The EU has, so this, these platform trials are going off. The enemy is, of course, everybody doing, some, so China did 90 clinical trials, but there was no standardization. The randomization was often uh, poorly described. They often threw the kitchen sink. Uh, so it's going to, the first one of uh, Calterra, I think it's a, a HIV uh, combination antiretroviral uh, they published in the New England Journal last week with kind of equivocal results and they were equivocal because the trial wasn't designed for uh, you know it, it was poorly designed so I know I've been working with this uh, working group the the people who are doing the design uh, of this study are the best in the world right so let's go with the best I agree I feel like um, Donald Trump is a little like Jim Jones right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Chloroquine Kool-Aid. Yeah. Right? Like, who the hell is drinking his Kool-Aid? I just don't get it. And the fact that he's telling people, well, the cure might be worse than the, um, what did he say? How did he frame it? The cure uh, is worse than the disease. The cure is worse than the disease. Are you insane? Like, this is just unbelievable that a world leader would put so many people at risk especially yes. the people that are going to listen to him who would vote for him in the next election. Exactly. So, Jeremy, here's where uh, the other half of my life comes into play. So my Canada research chair, half of it was working on all of these issues around pandemics. The other half was understanding multimorbidity uh, in primary care. So we got a bit I think we thought we had a sense of how the virus was going to behave in a system by using the Chinese example to inform our response. 80% generally well, 20% sick of that 20%, 5% require hospitalization, you know, and, uh, and you know, another proportion of that 5% require ICU and 2% die. Italy has contradicted that. And the reason is Italy, like Canada, is a con place where multimorbidity is the rule not the exception. And we know this, all of the studies that I did on multimorbidity and all the things that Martin Fortin's done in primary care, uh, the work of Laura Rizella and Walter Wadch just showing that in Ontario, uh, the vast proportion of people uh, 30 and above uh, are getting are multimorbid, are multimorbid. And multimorbidity and aging in particular do not combine well uh, with COVID. Do you think it has um, anything to do with a catecholamine burden that could um, um, exacerbate someone's illness? Um, I read a study on um, the flu vaccine mm. and that it lowered people's um, mortality rate who had um, comorbidities like heart disease. And the mechanism that they were proposing was that if you had the flu vaccine, 
you, you'd be at a less chance of activating the catecholamine cascade if you were to get the flu, which would then put pressure on the heart, right? And then if you're already having uh, heart disease, it would put you at risk for death, obviously. So I'm wondering if there's a similar mechanism. Yeah, so, so, so the, the, the immunology of uh, this coronavirus is quite um, intricate. And we're kind of learning on the fly. Uh, I haven't uh, thought so much about uh, cytokines and interleukins uh, and respiratory epithelium for a long time because I'm attending all of these uh, uh, therapeutics meetings where they're kicking around whether to use, uh, you know, this monoclonal antibody or this cytokine or interleukin in, uh, uh, inhibitor or promoter. Um, so we actually don't quite fully understand the immunopathology of the coronavirus yet. But man, people are working furiously on it. Okay. Um, so I, I think we're almost out of time here, but I just want to put a bug in your ear um, regarding clinical public health. Mm -hmm. And, and you're a member of our division. I am. Yeah. Um, how, so my, my challenge to you is use us. Yeah. Right. What's the best way? I mean, this, this podcast is called Small Changes, Big Impact. And if we've ever had a time for a small change and how we, um, you know, uh, come together and collaborate to improve the health of, of our patients, help me. Help me. Like I challenge you and everyone listening to come up with a way that we can start making clinical public health a reality where we can integrate um, family medicine and public health, but I need something to operationalize. I need people like you who are way smarter than me, um, probably like the third or fourth smartest person I've ever met, Ross. Um, you know? <laughs> You're very kind. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but you told me, I don't know if you remember um, David Naylor. You told me once that David Naylor was the smartest person you ever met. I think so, yeah. Yeah, and so then I, I spoke to David Naylor. He was, you know, happened to be sitting in uh, the waiting room and and uh, I came back to you afterwards, and uh, it turned out that both David and I had met Carl Skorecki, who <laughs> David thought was the smartest man he ever met. And I was like, oh, yeah, Carl's pretty smart. That's yeah. pretty awesome. So, you know, you're, you're up there. Um, so, so I challenge smart people now to say, listen, how can we mobilize? What can we do as frontline, other than supporting our patients, like because we're yep. already supporting our patients. We've got people who are on the front line volunteering for other positions that they can pick up at assessment centers. Um, I'm sure there are people who are going down in the hospital as hospitalists in small community hospitals um, that can probably pick up shifts there. Uh, people who are working in the ED. This isn't just a generalized Toronto question. This is a bigger Ontario question right now. Yeah. What else can we do as family doctors to help um, prevent this from getting worse? And that's, that's my challenge. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the small changes are, are changes that um, uh, I had proposed uh, a couple of years ago that didn't go anywhere. <laughs> uh, and it was basically about reorganizing um, uh, resources regionally to have uh, people identified as liaisons between, uh, you know, or a set of practices and public health. So you would have information flow backwards and forwards. So, I mean, it might be a good time to start instituting um, faux leads or fit leads. Well, yeah. As so a way to, to transmit information, right? Because we have those networks already set up. So I'm going to put in a naked plug uh, for a program that I administer, which is the, we now have an advanced standing MPH in the Dalalana School of Public Health for Family and Community Medicine, a one-year MPH. And, and, and I invite people to take to come, if you're interested, if you've been stimulated by or horrified by what you've seen happen, we need family physicians to come in, get that public health training, and then work with, remember, most, I also administer the Public Health Preventive Medicine Residency Program. All of them take their, C they do their CCFP, become card carrying family physicians before they go off to become, uh, do their public health training, become medical officers. We have the human resources. We need to organize them and connect them. 
And that's what I was, you know, I'd been, I'm not going to say who I talked to about proposals about building up this network. Uh, there are many uh, public health physicians who may or may not want to work as medical officers that might want to be kind of what in the triple aim we call integrators, people who, because public health physicians are the only physicians who get epi, biostats, uh, health, uh, uh, you know, systems training as a requirement for their exams. Um, and, you know, you come from a family physician, you understand you got your creds, you understand, you know what a family physician does. Then you understand what a public health physician does. You understand population health. So you've got a pyramid that goes from blanket coverage of, of family practices. You have leads who have taken, you know, they may or may not have an MPH and you've got these specialists just like we use cardiologists, right? And then we have a system, a system where part and whole were connections and information. And then all, you know, I'm so happy to hear that you're a sentinel surveillance physician. We should be doing that for a variety. You know, Sipson is one for chronic disease. We've got them for influenza, but we need to equip family physicians with public health tools so that they have real-time information that informs clinical decision-making. We well, can do this. So I'm willing to accept your challenge I know it sounds crazy because I already have two masters, but what's a third? <laughs> hey, you know me, I, <laughs> there's no ceiling to education. Right, what's a third? Um, no, I, I'm, I'm really considering this. So I would like to know more. If there's any way you can uh, send us the link, um, yep. or, because I'm gonna argue that, um, and, and maybe this is the point that we need to kind of um, um, end on, is that I would love your best Nostradamic take. I, I turned it into an adjective there. Um, <laughs> prognosticate for us. Um, because combining your challenge of, of, of picking up an MPH, and I'm going to challenge you to turn it into a distance learning opportunity. Would love to. Absolutely. And, and then combine that with the prognostics of how long do you think we are going to be um, like this in this... Uh, current situation. The law, I, I don't think it's two weeks like Trump is no. saying. No, the best case scenario is, so if you look at the Wuhan data, uh, they put the lockdown on the 23rd of January, plus minus a couple of days. Uh, they had four days with no cases. You can't declare an outbreak over until you have two incubation periods with no cases. So that's 28 days. Now, the big question is, and I'll send you this really excellent, they call it the hammer and the dance. You need to hit it really hard with a lockdown. And then once you've bent the curve down, and, and part of the bending the curve isn't the one that everybody's looking at because the area under the flattened curve is the same as this curve, right? So you're not really gaining anything. You're just pushing it all into primary care where you don't have any swabs or personal protective equipment, which makes no sense. And I've been arguing strenuously that there's a kind of incoherence to this flat. If the flattening of the curve is saving the hospital system, it's not saving the healthcare system because it's putting the onus entirely on primary care. And you know, the that's, the, that's the first rule of thermodynamics. Energy cannot <laughs> be created or destroyed. Yes, exactly. Right. Um, so, uh, so, you know, best case scenario is that we get this under control in six to eight weeks. Worst case scenario, I think, is the Imperial College model uh, that spreads it out to 18 months. Right. Um, in the, You're saying that I could have an MPH in those 18 months. You could. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to go harass my dean now. Okay. Yeah. Is that, uh, what's, who's the Dean of, uh, Stanley Brown. Yeah. Stan okay, great. Um, yeah. let me know when, uh, I can start matriculating. Uh, yeah. And is well, it, if it, you know, if, 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 if this podcast generates interest, uh, you know, I will, we, cause we now we're going to have a kind of companion division in, in our own department of family and community medicine. I would be more than happy to use my time and energy, uh, to, build that strength and capacity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Listen, do you need, you need a first follower for a movement. Have you seen that video? <laughs> no, I haven't. No, you haven't seen the first, oh, after this is done, Google first follower. All right. Actually, you could probably just Google it right now. I don't know if you're on the, for, let's see if that's what it is. First fall, I wanna make sure you get the right uh, first follower video. Oh yeah, just type in first follower video. Okay.
Okay. Let me be your first follower. All Ali right. Is a, is, a, is a second follower for a movement. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've got 10. I mean, the course I'm teaching now has eight family physicians in it. Oh, so you're already doing this. this yeah, I did. I did. So I did. I did the, the, we just, we have the advanced standing in now and the first class is going to be graduating and the first class I'll, I'll let them speak. They might be, uh, 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 they might have a different view, but I think they found the course that I gave rather um, applicable uh, because when we did the history of public health, it was all about ancient plagues and pestilences and quarantine and then boom, coronavirus hits and virtually everything we were talking about came to life. Yeah, so I do just want to remind people, um, and I've alluded to this already, since 2003, three coronavirus outbreaks, two Ebola, one H1N1 influenza pandemic, and the destroyer of destination weddings, Zika. Seven major infectious disease outbreaks, four of which were declared public health emergencies of international concern in 17 years. We will get through this and then we will have another. Yes, we so will. So let's get our act together. No excuses after this one because this has been truly global. Um, I'm going to have to uh, respectfully disagree with you because there will be excuses after this one. Of course and there will. <laughs> And we're going to learn lessons because it's a wake-up call. <laughs> it's a wake-up call. Okay, Ross, thank you so much. I, I hope, hope this is the, useful. Yep. Yeah, I hope to get the link for the MPH uh, from you. Maybe yes. people will start waking up and being like, maybe we need more training on how to deal with this stuff. Yep. Because if we can mobilize more people and train them uh, from a public health standpoint, then maybe we can actually start developing a system. I agree. Okay. Uh, I, 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 you know, even at my late age, I still remain... Uh, hopeful passionate passionate yeah yeah i love it i, I still give a damn <laughs> <laughs> me too yeah um, all right thank you again and have okay. a wonderful day we'll be and i'll send you the link also to that really instructive modeling exercise okay I look all right forward to it. Thanks, cheers Ross. thank you thank you take care keep well keep sane you too bye-bye bye-bye this podcast was made possible through the support of the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. Special thanks to Alison Mullen, Brian De Silva, and the whole podcast committee. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.